Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. Verses 1 through 4. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Father, we thank you this morning once again for the inspired word of God, the hope that we have, the consolation that we have, the benefits that are ours this morning through the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and Sanctifier today. Father, we thank you for this congregation this morning. We appreciate everyone that's put forth the effort to be here. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to their soul this morning. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to declare what thus saith the Lord. And Father, to speak as the oracle of God in your behalf under the anointing and inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Father, guide our lips and our tongue today. We want your help and blessing, Lord. We want this audience and congregation, Lord, to know the greatness of this wonderful plan of redemption. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you are aware, I have been trying to speak for the last four services on Sunday on this matter of holiness or sanctification. I concluded that holiness is beautiful, holiness is reasonable, holiness is biblical, holiness is provided, holiness is commanded, and last Sunday night we endeavored to speak on holiness is obtainable. You can have it in this life. Holiness this morning is what God is. Holiness this morning is what God designs for you and for me. Is that we might be holy because He is holy. He's provided a way through Jesus that you and I can be partakers of His divine nature. What do you mean? The Holy Spirit wants to come and abide and reside in your heart and life. He wants to come and make his abode with you, his home with you. Isn't that a wonderful provision that God would want to live with you and I? Isn't that a wonderful opportunity to have fellowship and communion with God personally because he lives and reigns right here in our hearts? The heavens of heavens cannot contain him, but yet he deigns to live within the confines of my heart and your heart. He wants you and I to be a partaker of His divine nature. He wants to give us the Holy Spirit of promise. He wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit. He wants us to pray in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit and worship in the Spirit and in truth this morning. Does He not? The Scripture says all of that. To pray in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit and to, to worship God in Spirit and in truth is the only way we can truly do that. And how can we do it any better than if He inspires our worship? He inspires our praise. He inhabits that this morning when we're partaker of His divine nature. When we have come to know the experience of holiness, the work of sanctifying grace in our hearts, it's who we are. It's who we say we are. We're of the holiness movement. 
I didn't hear a single amen. I assume we believe that. Maybe I have a wrong assumption here. Thank you, thank you. It's 1120. It's time to wake up, folks. <laughs> Set up and pay attention and say amen once in a while. It'll help your preacher. But holiness is what we claim to be. And if we claim to be holy and claim to live holy, this matter of holiness ought to be of keen interest to us. That we can know how to serve him better. That we can learn how to be more of what he would have us to be. But I'd like to speak to you this morning on two aspects of it. Some of it might appear a little boring. Maybe you don't like doctrine. But I'm glad for the glorious doctrine of holiness. I'm glad this morning that God provided an uttermost salvation. That all sin can be cleansed. All iniquity can be purged. That every trace of the fall can be erased in our heart. Now that doesn't mean we have a perfect head. That doesn't mean we make perfect decisions. But it does mean our motives have been purified. Our intent is to serve God. Our purpose is to bring Him glory and to love as He is loved and to have nothing in our hearts that's contrary to that love. And if God shows us anything, we'll deal with it. We'll, we'll just ask God to take care of it immediately. If He shows us anything in there that's unlike Him. And holiness as a doctrine this morning is scriptural, as I've already talked about it being biblical, but it's orthodox. And you know... <clears throat> It seems to me that churches are not real interested in being orthodox anymore. So what does that word mean? Orthodox sound in the Christian faith, believing the genuine doctrines taught in the scriptures. With over 700 references to holy, holiness, sanctify, sanctification, over 700 references in our King James Bible, this is a subject that God is greatly Greatly trying to impress upon our hearts. Greatly trying to impress upon our minds. And the doctrine of holiness is a glorious doctrine to think that your sins can be forgiven. That your account can be cleared totally. As though you had never sinned erased so thoroughly. That God justifies you wholly in his sight as though you had never committed a sin. You know, that's shouting grounds for anybody that's ever suffered from guilt. If you've ever been guilty and know you were guilty and felt the weight of that guilt, when someone could come and remove the guilt of your past and give you peace in its place, give you a hope and confidence of eternal life, friend, salvation is in the beginning is regeneration and it's pardon and it's forgiveness and it's our sins being done away with by the merits of Jesus Christ. But then there's this nature, this depravity, this, uh, this uh, principle that we were born with that's still there, it's still resident even in a believer's heart. And that God in His infinite love and mercy would see fit to not only forgive me of my sin, but He'd cleanse me from Adam's sin. He would take this depravity, this pollution of the soul, this enmity against God, this carnal mind that the Bible says is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, that God would take that out of me and cleanse me and in its place put His divine nature, His Holy Spirit within us. Friend, that's a glorious truth. That's a glorious doctrine this morning. And we better get a hold of it because it's biblical, it's commanded, it's provided, it's not optional. For those of us who know the way, I don't believe it's an optional thing. There may be many of those out there that have never heard the gospel of full salvation, but that's not true of our movement, is it? We've heard the message. It's been brought down from several generations. I was just thinking over the various groups, the Methodist, the Salvation Army, the Church of God Anderson, the Church of God Holiness, the Church of Christ in Christian Union, Wesleyans, Pilgrims, Nazarenes, Free Methodists, Bible Methodists, Wesleyan Methodists, God's Missionary, Bible Missionary, Bible Holiness, ICHA, Christian Missionary Alliance, and even Ebenezer Holiness Baptist. I mean, and that's just a partial list of the group of people that imbibe and believe or say they believe this glorious doctrine 
of entire sanctification or being made a partaker of his divine nature. Now, <clears throat> holiness is primarily a purity of heart that is wrought by the Holy Spirit when a believer is baptized in the Spirit. This purity of heart is the effectual cleansing of the heart from inbred sin and the filling of the heart with the Holy Spirit of promise and divine love. The purity that is produced by this mighty infilling is a purity of motive and any Christian perfection is one of motive and not necessarily of performance. We still make mistakes. Sanctified people sometimes fall short. I don't know about you, but I don't always please myself. I don't always live up to my expectations. But God sees the heart. God looks at the heart. And that's what the compromisers want to remind us. God doesn't care about the outside. God looks at the heart. He's the only one that can. If I see anything of Christ in you, it has to be visible. <laughs> If you have any effect on my life, it has to be something that's outward, something I can see or hear from you that is God-like. God does look at the heart, and He does at the saved, He does at the sanctified, and He's judging you by what you wanted to do. What your intention was, not how it came out. Aren't you glad for that? Because we're still full of faulty judgment, we're still full of... Faulty uh, uh, knowledge sometimes. We don't have all the facts. Told you about announcing that one time that so-and-so had died. Made announcement to the congregation, so-and-so in the community had died. Prayed for the family, got home, got a phone call. So-and-so wasn't dead. So you lied. Well, I did technically, but not motive. My motive was pure. My motive was was compassion and, and something reaching out of sympathy to the family. But I was given wrong information, and sometimes we are given wrong information. Sometimes we're acting on wrong information. Sometimes we're reacting to wrong information. And that's where we get in trouble, isn't it? But God doesn't hold that against you as long as you're acting from a heart of love that wanted to do the right thing. Holiness people aren't perfect in the sense that they never make mistakes, but they're perfect in the sense that they love God and want to please Him above everything else. Holiness as a doctrine is reasonable. It's, it's very reasonable. This purity is a purity of motive. And while Christian love and holiness will definitely affect and improve one's performance in spiritual matters and in moral areas, it does not guarantee absolute perfection or prevent mistakes, blunders, ignorances, faulty judgment, etc. It promotes spiritual growth and understanding, which with diligence will continue to bring the possessor of holiness into a closer walk with God. Now, I spoke to you very briefly about some of the ideas of holiness as to how it's attained. There's those individuals, and I... I don't know if you've read any of, after A.B. Simpson, the founder of Christian Missionary Alliance. He was a close friend to Seth C. Rees and, and Martin Wells Knapp, and you would maybe be familiar with those names, founders of the Pilgrim Holiness Church. And those men were great men in our movement. We highly esteem them. We're not as familiar with A.B. Simpson because he believed that while holiness was a crisis work, in one sense, he believed that it was a gradual work and a progressive work. And this is known as the Keswickian theory, if you're a theologian and want the technical terms. The Keswickians believe you grow into it, and I believe they distorted Simpson's view somewhat in later years. It is a crisis. There was a moment of time when the Holy Spirit came, on the day of Pentecost, there was a particular place. They were in the upper room in Jerusalem. There was a time and a place where the Spirit came. That makes it a crisis experience. There's a time and a place where the Spirit comes. But friend, even after the Spirit comes, there is room for a lifetime of growth and maturity in the things of God. There has to be some 
marriage of these two ideas. It does not make us absolutely mature. It does not give us all the wisdom of a lifetime of reading the Bible or a lifetime of living through circumstances and learning how to avoid pitfalls. You look at the older saints, and I've heard some of the younger Christians, oh, I'd like to be like sister so-and-so. I'd love to be like brother and so Well, you've got to live their life. You've got to go through their battles. You've got to go through their trials. You've got to suffer what they've suffered and endure what they've endured. And it has tempered them and it has seasoned them. And they've learned not to react to certain things. They've learned to, to do certain things that make them appear very mature and godly. And that's true. So there has to be a wedding somewhere of a crisis experience where there's a moment in time where the Spirit cleanses you and fills you and then there is a room for a lifetime of growth and development, friend. Any holiness that doesn't allow for improvement is not scriptural. Because the very next verses in my text this morning, if your Bible's still open, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And add to your virtue knowledge. And add to your knowledge temperance. And on and on down through that list of things. This is a continual growth into the graces that God has for us. Amen? This is true this morning. The doctrine of holiness is true. There, it is of necessity a second work of grace due to the twofold nature of sin. Sin committed by an individual can and must be forgiven. Sin will either be pardoned or punished. Do you know that? You'll either get it under the blood or it'll meet you at the judgment. And it'll be punished if it meets you at the judgment. But thank God there's a fountain open. And the soul unclean can plunge beneath the blood of Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood and lose all their guilty stains. Thank God for a fountain that's open for sin in our day. Sin must be repented of. But friend, not only is uh, the second work of grace, it's because this Adamic nature, this carnal nature, this inherited depravity is not mine. I didn't choose it. I've inherited it. But God made wonderful provision to cleanse it as we've already labored that point before. The old nature of sin, the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, the old man must be crucified and purged from our nature to allow the Holy Spirit to reign unmolested because this law in our members that you were born with is going to resist you in the things of God. It's going to be an enemy within, a traitor on the inside to the things of God. But thanks be unto God, he can be removed. The old nature can be removed. You know, in terminology, you think about it being a second work of grace. Even in the typology, the Red Sea is not the Jordan, is it? Those were two distinct crises in the history of Israel. One, they were delivered from Pharaoh and sin, and the hard taskmaster was defeated. In the second, they inherited a land of promise where God was going to bless them and multiply them and use them. It was not heaven. Canaan cannot be heaven because the first thing they did when they got to heaven was to have a big fight with the people of Jericho. There won't be any fighting when you get to heaven. There won't be any wars to fight when you get to heaven. But as long as you're in this body, there's a battle to be won. There's an enemy. There's an adversary that wants to destroy what God's done in your heart. Friend, the godliest man Wesley knew was a man by the name of John Fletcher. And John Fletcher testified that he lost the experience of entire sanctification five times for failing to testify to it. And Wesley said Fletcher was the godliest man he ever knew. And he was. He he wrote the, the works, the uh, checks to antinomianism. If you want some really heavy reading, if you really want some top-notch scholarly reading about this sinning religion, anti means against, nomian means law. We have people that are against God's law. They say you don't have to keep the law. You don't have to keep the commandments. Antinomian. And Fletcher wrote about five volumes, I think it is, uh, in his checks to antinomian. Maybe not that many, but they're, they're big. And uh, did a great job at it. But the old nature of sin has to be removed. The Red Sea is not the Jordan. Deliverance from Pharaoh and sin's bondage is not inheriting the promised land. The new birth is not a baptism. 
The Bible calls salvation the new birth. It calls sanctification being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Those are not the same words. Salvation is not sanctification. The terminology itself, the experience itself, the very teaching of the Scripture teach us this morning that it is a second definite work of God's grace. It says in Acts 2, 1 through 4, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. We know that to be the upper room. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. It happened at a specific time, in a specific place. There was a moment of history they were not filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there came a moment in history that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And you should have a time and a place where you know that the Spirit has come in sanctifying power. It is a crisis experience. It's something we need to get back to, to believing that it's instantaneous. It's the work is done in a moment. The Holy Spirit is the author and, and sanctifier of our soul. He's able to cleanse us in a moment's time. And then he's able to lead us into all truth and righteousness and godliness. He'll continue to help us to grow on a daily basis. But even though it was instantaneous, when the Spirit comes to take his place in our heart, don't ever forget, you're not done yet. There's no graduating in this school. There's no diploma down here. You don't get to a plateau and say, I have attained. There was a very famous preacher by the name of Paul. He said, I have not attained. I have not arrived. And if he hadn't arrived, I, I little suspect most of us are not going to arrive in this world. But we're striving. We're running the race with patience. We're fighting the good fight of faith. We're trying our best to lay hold of eternal life by walking in the light, by being obedient to the Spirit. Friend, I'm glad this very hour that that's what it's going to take to get us into heaven. It's an instantaneous work when the Spirit comes to abide in our heart. But then He begins to lead us and guide us upward and onward through the things of God. Well, the doctrine is an amazing, amazing, glorious doctrine but the experience. I'd like to talk to you for just a few minutes about the experience. The experience of entire sanctification is almost as varied as the people that profess it. There is a danger, or at least there was, when there was maybe greater hunger in our movement for the things of God, of trying to imitate someone else's experience or trying to, waiting on it in the manner that they heard that someone else received it. Friend, you don't need to ever look for God to duplicate himself. <laughs> no two snowflakes are the same. No two eyeballs are the same. No two thumbprints are the same. God is a God of infinite variety and of individuality and God can tailor make your experience just for you but it will be just as real to you as theirs was to them. I've not seen the cloven tongues of fire, have you? I did not hear a rushing mighty wind. I did not feel the building shake under me. These were phenomena that took place in the early church and thank God for them. There was a need to get attention. There was a need to bring attention to what was going on to help further the gospel. But friend, I want to tell you this morning, our experience can be absolutely genuine. Our experience can be absolutely glorious. And it can be just as good as somebody else's if you don't run the aisles, if you don't walk the backs of the benches, if you don't get up and shout for three hours, it still can be real to you if you meet the conditions. Amen? The actual manifestation of the Spirit is very different for every believer. This is why we dare not expect God to do it like He did it for so and so. And I've even... <clears throat> Even there is somewhat of a slight danger, or there was, when people would read the extraordinary stories, and I'm going to share a couple with you in closing this morning. We read about those giants of yesteryear, and 
We read about the hilarious uh, experience or however it was that God gave them the Holy Spirit and we seem to look at that and ours looks so tame and ours might look so, so insignificant as compared to someone else's. But I want to tell you, friend, there's a danger in trying to make your experience match theirs. You don't need to do that. God has a tailor-made experience for every one of us. But the glory of it is, as you will know, the Spirit will bear witness to your heart. He will. There is a witness to your salvation, and there is a witness to your sanctification, and the Spirit will bear witness to it. The experience, the 120 were in an upper room. They had been seeking for 10 days. They were all filled at the same time. So I guess we need to rent an upstairs apartment. We all need to take 10 days off from work. We all need to get together up there and pray and whatever else they did for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, we're going to expect the Spirit to come on every one of us at the same time. Do you believe that's what we ought to do? Might not be a bad idea. But I don't think it's necessary. I don't think God needs to duplicate that part of it. But I believe he will duplicate what he did in the hearts of those believers to us today. Because he said, if I go away, I will send you another comforter. And he will abide with you forever. Friend, the Holy Spirit is who he's talking about. And he wants to come in his sanctifying feeling in each one of our hearts. So we don't have to be in an upstairs building. We don't have to call a 10-day prayer service. If there's 20 of us present, we all don't have to be sanctified at the very same moment. Some find it at a public altar. Some find it in private. And really, one's as good as the other if you really find it, isn't it? Amen. Doesn't matter where we're sanctified. I'll call him my brother by virtue of being a Christian, but John T. Hatfield... He had a glorious conversion. How many has read 33 Years of Live Wire? You have to read that book. You must read about my spiritual forefather. <laughs> At least namesake. I don't know that we're any kin blood-wise, but he was a true Hadfield. Had a glorious conversion experience. He struggled with carnality for eight long years. And when I say struggled, I mean he struggled. The cow knew he was carnal. The sitting hen knew he was carnal. He tells the story in his book how him and his wife, they were wanting this hen to set on these eggs. And if you've ever dealt with chickens, you can, you can understand the scenario. They don't always want to set on someone else's eggs. And John T. Hatfield ran into a carnal hen. And uh, before the day was over with, he took her over to a nest where they'd laid the eggs and he placed her very gently on those nest of eggs. And then after a while, the hen jumped up. She didn't want any part of it. He grabbed her and he said, not so gently this time. He set her back down. And immediately she gets back up. She has no interest in sitting on those eggs. As time went on, he set her down a little harder and one egg got broke and a few feathers were missing off the hen. He said by the time he was through, every egg was broken and the hen was about half plucked. And he was in bad trouble with the Lord. And in his words, he had to go take his pill, the bitter pill of repentance. Old John T. Hatfield repented over and over and over. And friend, if you give vent to carnality, you have to repent over and over and over too. You have to do your first works over. You have to lay your foundation of repentance again every time you have a carnal display. Amen, preacher. The old cow continually tormented him. She loved to kick over the milk bucket. And one time... He'd allow, the cow had allowed him to get the milk bucket full. He had his milk bucket in hand, went around to pass behind the cow, and the old cow gave him a swift, give him a swift kick. Not in our culture, Butch. The, the, well, he we just live takes, in a culture pours of death. the milk out and beats her with the bucket. Take the euthanasia movement. These people aren't all out of their mind. The, the doctors told them you have cancer. 
But his pastor, and you have the right the to of die with dignity James before Leonard you wither away to attend a holiness you get meeting in Indiana held by the National, Asso National Holiness Association. And he came back a different man. His sermons were not the same. There was fire in his messages. And Hatfield said you could feel it burn. This convicted his heart. And he became a seeker after holiness. Many things tried to beset him, including the hens, the cows, and even his wife kind of gave him issues at time. You might have heard the story of John T. He was a little impatient. Maybe that's a youth, but maybe that's not really accurate. He was a lot impatient. And his wife was taking longer to get ready for church, and he left her. He just left her. Went on to church without her. Well, about two-thirds of the way through service, guess who walked in? Sister Hatfield walked in. Sat down like nothing had happened. Just as sweet, mild, and kind. And old John T. said, I felt like a dog. Felt like a dog. And uh, he sought God. He began to seek God diligently for something that would take care of this temper and this impatience, take care of this awful thing that was ugly and caused him to beat the cow. And Finally, God, in a revival meeting. But see, he, he took his pill after every situation. He was able to keep his regenerated uh, life intact after he would repent and get back to God every time he would come back and with victory shouting victory and he would come to church at this revival this particular night there were seekers at the altar and he was, he was up there praying for those seekers to get through and all of a sudden he realized that he wasn't praying for them anymore he was praying for God to sanctify his heart and he said that very night God gloriously filled him with the Holy Ghost and fire. And friend, the rest is history. He went back. The cow tried him. He, she kicked over the milk bucket. He just went up and put his arm around her neck. And I think her name was Old Leo, I think was the name of the cow. It's been a long time since I read the book. But he said, Old Leo, he said, I'm a new man now. Jesus has taken the old kickback out of me. And he told the cow and it testified to her what God had done for him. You said, that's foolishness, that's nonsense. You can call it foolishness if you want, but I tell you, carnality will hurt your testimony. It'll ruin your experience as far as others are concerned. If you don't get rid of it, the old timer said it'll get rid of you, spiritually. Holiness as an experience will do something for you. Bud Robinson, the old Nazarene preacher of yesteryear, he was uh, saved... Oh my, he had such a wonderful conversion experience. I think it went something like God had saved him. He went to under his old covered wagon out in, under the Texas sky, I believe it was. He said the stars were brighter that night after God had saved him. He said, and as he laid under that wagon that night, looking up, talking to his heavenly father, he said, God poured enough glory into my soul that night to save the whole state of Texas. God just blessed him and blessed him. And for 10 glorious years after his conversion, he served the Lord. They didn't want to give him a preacher's license. He felt a call to preach. He had a stutter. He couldn't speak real plain. And the group did not want to give him a preacher's license. So they gave him an exhorter's license. And finally, Uncle Bud said, if I'm ever going to get this, I'm going to have to start preaching it. He had preached on holiness. And they said, folks, I don't have this. I'm going to the altar myself. And he sought God. But he was sanctified in his cornfield, June the 2nd, 1890. He was so blessed and happy, he could scarcely stay in the body, were his words. He said from nine in the morning until noon, he just laid there in his cornfield, reveling in the glory and the grace of God. Isn't that something? So boy, I'd like to have an experience like that. Well, God may not. Maybe you'll need a cornfield first. You know, some people need a corn patch to hoe. But uh, it doesn't have to be in the cornfield. But old Uncle Bud, he's one of the biggest names in the holiness movement. Written several books. He said, I praise God that I was converted in time to get into the holiness movement and sanctified in time to get the movement into me. 
Praise God. Then I think about Samuel Logan Bringle. He was converted at 13, planning on being a lawyer, but God intervened and called him to preach. The old man troubled him, though. Bothered him, even a, a young boy, and as he lived, and he knew he must have this inward cleansing. 1 John 1, 7, God used it to, to bring conviction on him. And he felt the big hindrance in his heart was the desire to win the admiration of educated people. A man-pleasing spirit. Wanting the approval of the world. You know, carnality comes in a lot of different pictures. A lot of different ways. It may not be temper. It may not be some of these other things that get preached on a whole lot. But this love for attention, this love for approval, he, he struggled with it. And 1 Corinthians 1, 29 came to him and he said that no flesh should glory in his presence. And God revealed the idol of his soul was the passion for glory. Bringle was a gifted orator and speaker, but he finally got to the place where he prayed, Lord, let me stammer and stutter if that's the way I can bring glory to God. And a few days later, on January the 9th, 1885, at 9 o'clock in the morning, God sanctified my soul, was his testimony. He gave me such a blessing as I had never dreamed a person could have this side of heaven. It was like a heaven of love that came into my heart. I walked out over Boston Common before breakfast, weeping for joy and praising God. Samuel Logan Bringle left, uh, oh, I think it was the Methodist Church at that time, and went to join the Salvation Army. General William Booth was skeptical of him at first. And his first assignment, this is an educated man, this is a gifted man, this is a man with great preacher potential. His first assignment when he was put in the corps of the Salvation Army was to shine the new cadet's boots. Humbling. Demeaning. But Bringle passed the test. He shined the cadet's boots. Bringle went on to write some of the greatest books on holiness you'll ever get a hold of. If you haven't read The Soul Winner's Secret, Heart Talks on Holiness, The Way of Holiness, uh, When the Holy Ghost Has Come, these are all excellent, excellent books that will help you to gain insight into this matter of holiness. But friend, the experience. Some people have the doctrine, even though some are leaving the doctrine. Some of the old, older line Former holiness churches have already changed the doctrine. They've left that. Some still have the doctrine in your manual, but they don't stress it or emphasize it anymore. But friends, so many of our movement are losing the emphasis on the experience. Having a clean heart. Having a pure heart. Being filled with the Holy Ghost. That ought to be our fervent prayer and desire is to be full of God, to have a cleanness and purity about us that only God can work in our hearts. Only God can put it there. But God wants to give us an experience. It may not be like John T's. It may not be in the cornfield. It may not be at nine o'clock in the morning. And you might not go all over Boston shouting and praising God. But you can have an experience where you can be a partaker of His divine nature. Friends, we must know that we're saved. That's the first step. Then we must go on. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Holiness is essential this morning. It's essential. I, I trust we'll pray that God will once again bring this emphasis, bring this desire back into the church world that God wants and expects a holy people. He does, and it's very clear. You pray for the service tonight as we try to speak on the lifestyle of holiness. Shall we stand?